So you need to win that friend category, that benefit category. And again, that is one not at a verbal level, it's taken at a non-verbal level. You need to, uh, you know, train yourself in the non-verbal indicators of, of friend, of trust, of benefit. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I've got Mark Bowden with us here today, and we're going to talk about the power of nonverbal communication, leveraging body language for sales success. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, good to see you, Steve. Thanks for having me around. Absolutely. Well, just to introduce you, um, Mark is a global authority on nonverbal communication. He's been voted the number one body language professional in the world for the last two years. Mark is also the founder of the communication training company, Truth Plane, where he trains professionals on how to use their body language to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate. His client list includes presidents, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, prime ministers of G7 powers, who will remain unnamed, I suppose. <laughs> um, Absolutely. He, he is the best. He's a best selling author of four books on the subject of body language and human behavior, including the famous book, Winning Body Language for Sales Professionals. So, this is, I'm really excited to have you here, Mark. This is fantastic. Um, I've got a, a handful of questions for you to, to teach the audience, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you, that, you know, um, so first off, most salespeople often care too much about what they're saying and they don't pay that much attention to how they say it. Tell, tell us about how nonverbal communication affects sales pitches. Yeah, sure. So we judge people instantly on their image, on their behavior, on their nonverbal communication, and we create what we call a framework for what they say. So you may have an incredible verbal pitch, you may have a great product, you have, may have great service, that's all well and good, but people are making a decision around how they take in that information, and especially whether they can trust you, and if you are credible and your product, your service is credible, based on the behavior that you frame that pitch with. And we do it instantly. And, and when we've made that judgment about you, that judgment tends to stick as well. Yes, it can be undone, but then there's work for you to do to undo it. So I would suggest you want to create a great first impression because that first impression, whether it's true or false, sticks. And then it, it, that first impression gives us a framework by which we judge your content, your pitch, whatever you deliver to us. So that's why it's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I can, you know, we've only been talking for a few minutes here, but I can just tell that you're, you're so animated when you speak, you know, you're, you move your hands, you, you move your head, you move your eyes, like it's almost like you're dancing or something up there, you know, like you've got you've got a, a cadence or a rhythm that, um, that I think a lot of people could learn from. Um, just in, in fact, I would I would say all the people that are listening to this on a podcast, I'd, I'd switch for this episode over to the to the to YouTube and watch this guy because it's 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 interesting to watch. It's like there's a lot to I, I, this is a whole area that I can tell that I don't, don't know very much about, and I've got a ton to learn from you. So, <laughs> well, actually, to the, to that point, so we can get people to make that switch to video. Why don't I just quickly tell you about three types of gesture that I'm using specifically, which are some of the things that are attracting you to what I'm saying and, and getting you really confident around what I'm saying. The first type of gestures that I'm using are open palm gestures, and you'll see those a lot. I'm doing them for you right now. Open palm gestures are a universal signal that say no tools, no weapons. You can trust me. I'm safe. I'm low risk. If I'm low risk, my product, my service for you is low risk as well. So if you're wanting to help 
your your clients, your customers, with a sense that what you have for them makes everything in their life less risky. You need to be low risk as well. Those are the gestures that I'm giving you right now. I'm also giving you what we call baton gestures. Baton gestures are the gestures that conduct along to the rhythm of my speech, like a, a conductor's baton conducts along to the rhythm. Oh, okay. Yeah, baton. Your lang- baton. I was like, baton. Baton, baton like gesture. Batter? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> not, a, not a big stick. A small, <laughs> a small stick that a guy in a tailcoat or a woman in a tailcoat mm-hmm. might, might uh, wear as they conduct along. Now, these help you understand and the rhythm of my speech. Yes, your, your your Broca's area, the part of your brain which does speech, listens to the sound, but it also looks out for rhythmic movement. I'm giving you really strong rhythmic movement as well. What this does is makes your brain more comfortable listening to me. If you're more comfortable, then you're more comfortable in me, you're more comfortable about my product, my service for you. One last type of gesture which I'm using is what we call illustrator gestures. These are the gestures that literally draw pictures for you. It's like if I were to say higher and lower and actually show you higher, one hand higher and one hand lower. Again, your brain loves to see illustrations of what I'm saying. If you mix all of these together, you get somebody who's way more compelling. And let me give you just one example of that. I'm going to now hide my gestures from you on camera so you don't see anything. Same person, same product, same service, same expert for you. What I'm going to tell you is that I have some help for you that I think will radically improve your ability as a salesperson. And I want you to trust me around that. Alternatively, I'm going to show you this person where you can see my baton gestures, my open palm gestures, and my illustrators. And I'm going to say, I have some help for you that I can think can radically improve your ability as a salesperson. And I want you to trust me around that. Now, give us some feedback, Steve. Is there one of me that you have a bias towards? Is there one of me that you're more comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, I- Absolutely. I mean, you can just see it jump right off the page. I mean, there it's uh, and I and I and I can't put my finger on why. It's like a lizard brain thing or something, yeah. right? But it's like it's exactly it's like, that. Uh, it, 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 there. Mm, why is it? Yeah, no. It's just it's more dynamic. It's more interesting. Like uh, it, it's. Uh, but it makes me want to get my hands in frame here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So look, it's happening. This is working on a part of your brain which is unconscious to you. If you were conscious of the part of the brain that this is working on, you wouldn't be able to get on with your daily life because you wouldn't be able to make decisions quickly. The part of the brain that I'm talking to now, which is what we call the reptilian brain or the primitive brain or the brain stem or the R complex. It's the part of the brain that judges the world instantly based on the images and patterns that it sees around it. I'm just giving you patterns that it likes. And so you like me more than the person who you don't see the patterns of. Because when insufficient data, your instinct defaults to a negative. So if I don't show you stuff, you just default to negatives. If I show you more, you get more optimistic about me. Therefore, you get more optimistic about everything that I have to say. So I could have a great pitch for you, okay? But if you don't see my gestures, it will seem like a worse pitch. Same pitch, and you get to see my gestures and these specific baton gestures, illustrators, and open palm gestures, you get more optimistic about that pitch. So interesting. I mean, it's... Yeah, so I insist everyone stop listening to the podcast. Go, <laughs> go to the YouTube <laughs> version of this. Like seeing this guy is is fantastic. Um, yeah, just go to the. It, there, we put them all on the Badger Maps YouTube channel, and just outside sales talk is a uh, uh, what do they call it? Like a it's like a series, just like a bunch of videos together. That section, and uh, this has got this is going to be like number one hundred and fifteen or something. Can't can't miss it. Um, just search Mark Bowden, but it's. This is fantastic to see. Um, this is a guy you got to see, not listen to. <laughs> but you're maybe, you're maybe picking up even in my voice what happens when I start to use these gestures. Because again, if I now, you know, kind of nail my gestures down and don't make any gestures and I'm just going to, you know, look down the camera, I've got a good pitch for you, you know, understand I am an expert in my field and I'm here to help you. And now look what happens when I let those gestures work for me. I use those baton gestures, those illustrators. There's a whole different tone of voice that comes with it as well. 
So again, if you haven't managed to get yourself to the YouTube channel right now, <laughs> do it. And do you're it. listening to this podcast uh, in your vehicle as you go to your next customer or client, you're probably still hearing some of the differences that this creates as well. Yeah, and another thing I'm seeing that you do, you're, you're very animated with your face, right? Like, so your 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 face is like using big gestures, and your eyes, I've noticed, especially like you're you're opening them and moving your eyebrows around. It's uh, it, it, there there's something to learn there too. Yeah, so we, we call it animation, as you say. You're very animated. Animation, great word, comes from Latin anima, which simply means life. It means to be alive. What I'm trying to do, especially because this is via video, um, or for those of you listening, this is just via sound, is it would be easy for your brain to think that I'm not alive right now. Because, you know, this is a recording. It'd be easy for your brain to go, ah, you know, this is a little bit dead and lifeless. So I'm doing things that trigger your brain into recognizing this is a live human being more right now and again that engages you more now if i were live in front of you i might not be quite as big and animated i might do but probably not quite as big and animated because you would literally know i was live right in front of you right now and again that would raise the stakes the moment two live people come together the stakes are relatively high via video via sound stakes become lower because we're not in the same geographical location there's less risk for you more risk when i show up live hope that makes sense yeah i know it does and, and and you know when you're doing these gestures it actually reminds me a little bit of uh of that movie tommy boy where he's like in the sales scenes and he's like selling like his product in a box and he's like I could take a crap at a box and put a guarantee on it. And you, but in, when he's giving his pitches, like, and he's, he's obviously a very animated guy and he's like, you know, moving his hands around and like, and so the way you're doing it actually kind of reminds me of, uh, of him the way he's like, I could put this in a box. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, look, the thing is, is I'm, I'm maybe being a little more extreme so that, you know, if you're watching this right now, you can really see what I'm doing uh, because it would be terrible if it was so subtle. Everybody came away from the video going, yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what he was doing. So, so I'm being really clear for you yeah. um, right now. But yes, you know, ultimately, we all know this is that there's having a great product and service and being able to explain that to people, but then there's really animating it for them and making it really live for them and getting them really engaged in it. If they don't engage, they're not listening. And if they're not listening, it doesn't matter how good your pitch is. Their, their brain has a hierarchy and that, that hierarchy is looking for what is most valuable to me right now. And yes, that the product, the service that you have may not be the most valuable thing to them right now. But if you animate yourself, you become really in the forefront of their mind. And therefore, your product, your service becomes more in the forefront of their, their mind. Your, your job as a salesperson is to change people's behavior. That's what you do. They're, they're buying, they're not buying or they're not buying enough or you're worried that they're going to stop buying. And therefore, you're in the business of behavior or change. And that's what we're doing through influence and persuasion via nonverbal communication is trying to influence people to change their behaviors. And the first step is, can you engage them? Sure. Well, and I wonder if this can also affect other areas of perception about them. Like salespeople, for example, are frequently, there's a stereotype that they're, that they're being pushy is there a way to counter that with body language? So is there a way for salespeople to use their body language in order to avoid being perceived as pushy or being salesy? Yeah, absolutely. Because we know what pushy looks like, okay? We know exactly what pushy will do. It will literally push people, grab people, you know, pull them towards you, you know, push their face in the product, you know, it will literally try and manipulate people and grab people and push them into a corner, into a situation where they have to buy against their own better judgment or best wishes. And therefore they'll get buyer's remorse and they'll, they won't trust you anymore or they'll send back the order. So let me, let me ask you this, you know, having seen those gestures of, of, of pushiness, of grabbing, of pulling you towards me. What would be the opposite of being pushy? What, what, I, what kind I, of sound? 
I mean, I think the the open palm gesture that you were talking right. before seems really like like leaning back, opening the palms. Like I feel like that's a very safe, not pushy. It's like the opposite. It's almost like if you were saying, "I'm not pushy," you can that that's right. the gesture that you would make. You'd back, you'd lean back and put up your hands and you know, move them around like this. Like it, it's so. Yeah. It, yeah, perfect. Is, so we know how too? to do that. So as you were explaining your point of view, I started tilting my head to one side, nodding, smiling, and started to do accepting body language, accepting behavior. So instead of pushing my ideas on you, I'm now going to show you the body language of accepting your ideas. Now, as, as you give your ideas, so I would ask you questions and I would show you lots of accepting body language, just like you showed me, open palm gestures, head tilted to one side, nodding the head, really open in the torso area, not protective, and again, not pushing at you. And I would show you those behaviors while you're giving me your ideas, and then I'll start to give you my ideas and I'll continue the behavior of acceptance because look how you're mirroring this behavior right now. You're nodding your head at exactly the same rate as I am right now. And I'm just telling you stuff. I'm actually doing very, very pushy words and pushy statements, but I'm using accepting body language, which you love to mirror. So that, that would be what you want to go for, I think. Rather than pushing your ideas on people, hear their ideas, do accepting body language, keep that accepting body language, and then deliver your ideas. And you'll see they nod along with you in an accepting way. Accept them first. That's what we call influence and persuasion because influence, again, is Latin, and it literally means to be in the river with the person, in, in flow to be in the river with them. So you want to join them in their thinking, accept their thinking, keep that behavior, and then verbally you can push your thinking, but you don't non-verbally push it. Does that, does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've never thought of the etymology of influence, but yeah, flu, like fluid influence. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Very, very cool. Um, so you, you say in your book, that salespeople can earn their customer's trust without saying a word. What's, what's the secret to that? Yeah, so again, it's this moment that uh, another human being has when they judge you and they decide, is this person good for me? Are they a friend? Are they an asset for me? Or are they uh, a negative situation? Are they a risk for me? Or alternatively, should I just be indifferent to them? They're not a risk. They're not a benefit. I don't even need to look at them. I mean, I may be, I'm going to hold the meeting with them because they showed up. You know, they, they drove their vehicle. They got there. They showed up. So I'm going to be polite. But, but at, a, at an instinctual level, I know there's nothing going on here for me. So you need to win that friend category, that benefit category and again that is one not at a verbal level it's taken at a non-verbal level you need to uh you know train yourself in the non-verbal indicators of of friend of trust of benefit and they're the indicators that you know you were describing to me and i've shown you back as well which are plenty of open palm gestures and very open in the torso area gestures that can be seen as well i mean i'm on ca camera with you right now so i'm making sure my gestures come into frame so you can see them and there's lots of open palm gestures with you if i were live with you then you know you would see more of me if i was sitting down you know, you'd see more of me. And again, I do plenty of open palm gestures with you. And again, that wins trust with you immediately. And I'd want to be doing that the moment I came into your environment. That I show you those big open palm gestures so you know you can trust me. Interesting. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. It, it, I think that I move my hands around a lot, but I noticed that I'm, I do it below the, well below the frame. So I'm always talking with my hands and moving them and stuff, but no one can see them on video. Whereas in real life, you'd be able to see them. So I almost feel like when, when selling on video, I should like back away or you know, turn the, turn the video down so you can see my, my hands, which are moving down by, they're down by my belly button area. You know, they're not up by my, my chest. Yeah. Yet. 
Yeah, so if I were live with you, I would be wanting to do, you know, in the same location, I would be wanting to do more open palm gestures at exactly navel height. Because in that one-to-one, -one, you know, in that real geographical location environment, you would be able to see these gestures. On camera, you can't so much. So I need to bring the gestures up into the frame so that you, you're able to see them. Now, the risk of that is that it brings the gestures into what we call passion. So it's quite exciting up here. If I were live with you face to face in the same geographical location and my gestures were always up this high, yeah, it would be quite tough to be around me. Because yeah, it's very, it's very, heart, it's very Italian, you know. They're always it's, moving, it's very Italian, very right intense. Here. But on video, it's fine. On video, it works great. Live, it would be a little bit too intense to be like that all the time. So you'd want to be moderating that slightly. But even even if you've got a very close up camera, let me uh, switch to another camera for you. Even if you've got something quite close up and you're not going to see my gestures so much. Again, notice what I do with my eye contact. I keep really good, strong eye contact with you. There's a little light smile in my face. So you're seeing plenty of gesture in the face in that close-up situation. Again, I'm trying to keep it really animated for you. But again, live, if I were this close with you, I would be in intimate space with you. And if we didn't know each other really well already, this would be triggering fight and flight for mm -hmm. you because this is way too close for a live situation but on camera works fine interesting okay uh yeah and i bet a lot of this is cultural i bet there are certain cultures that are just better at gestures like i i just think about the time i've spent in italy like they're they talk with their hands and they wave their arms around and it's it's very exciting and animating and, and and looks very cool and it's maybe it's one i i love the italian language and i wonder if that's one reason i like it so much is the people that are speaking it you know are just so uh animated and, and full of life as you as you define the word animated. well interesting <laughs> enough the moment you start speaking um a a, a more latin-based language so italian spanish um uh portuguese uh, there are more syllables per unit of meaning than if you're doing a, a Germanic based language like English, essentially. So, um, you know, if you know anything about Spanish or French, you know, how long does it take you to say, I'd like a drink of water, please? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in one of those Latin languages, about double the time that it does in, in English. So you need more syllables and in order to create more syllables you have to work a part of the brain called the broccus area more you have to have more brain action just so happens that the hands and the fingers are attached to the broccus area so when we start to become more complex in our words we start to use our hands more that's why if you head to those latin countries there'll be more hand gestures more more uh finger movement as well also the arms will get higher because you're now nearer to the equator. So you actually lose heat a lot better if you bring your arms higher because it dissipates from underneath your armpits. So all of, all of these think, cultural things actually come down to the types of languages that are being used, how, much, how taxing that is on the brain, and also the geographical location of the language as well and, and, and you know, how much heat is involved. Go to a cold Scandinavian country, very few syllables per unit of meaning. People will keep their hands down by their side and won't be waving their hands around because you die if you end up, you know, waving your hands around in cold countries. You just lose too much heat too quickly. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, you know, so I speak Spanish and Portuguese and, and I've always noticed that my gestures change when I'm speaking those languages compared to English. Like I'll, I'll notice myself and I, and I, and I think it, I think it's what you said just really resonated with me because it's a lot of like keeping the beat almost like I'll, I'll wiggle my hands like this to like, you know, keep the beat, you know, it's like, cause it's, and, and maybe it is because there's so many more syllables and because it rhymes more like, because a lot of the words end in the same like letters and sounds, um, it's just more of a rhythmic. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's going to be more baton gestures in order to let people know the rhythm of the speech. You don't need so many baton gestures in a, in a Germanic based language because you can get across lots of stuff with it, maybe one or two syllables. How, how can salespeople read their prospects body language to uncover their real feelings and intentions? 
Yeah, so here's the clue to uh, reading people's body language really, really well, is don't look for detail, look for big changes. That's all you want to do, look for big changes. Stuff that we would call notable changes, something that you feel is a notable change. Okay, so um, maybe the, the, the prospect um, has been lent forward uh, for the majority of the time. That's what we call the baseline. You know, that's where they tend to be. And you're talking about something and suddenly they, their whole body goes back. Now, I don't know what that means. And I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. But what I do is use that in order to ask a question. So I've noticed there's a big change. So I stop what I'm saying and I just say, so I'm just curious, what do you think and feel about what I've been talking about? So I'm now using an interrogation question with two ideas, think or feel. Yeah, what do you think or feel about what I've been saying? Because I want them to tell me what's going on right. for them. Because they, be they could be leaning back because you've just made them rethink their whole life and existence or they could be Possibly. leaning back because they're like wow that was a stupid thing he just said that doesn't relate to my <laughs> right. business at all <laughs> right could be anything listen let, let's let's just look at kind of folding arms because this is a classic in body language that people go oh yeah you know if they fold their arms they're closed off what well, just so happens when somebody's making a decision they also fold their arms when people are cold they fold their arms. When people are being protective of themselves, they when people are comfortable, they fold it. Sometimes there's no arms on the chair. They've got nowhere else to put their arms and they just want to um, stop their hands moving so they can really think about something. So I don't know why that prospect just folded their arms, but I'm going to ask. So I'm going to find out why and i do it by just saying so i'm just going to stop right now because i'm just curious you know how are you how are you feeling about what i'm talking about here or what do you think of what i just said and and now i'm just going to listen because they might go you know what i really like this or they might go i hate this idea this is ridiculous or they go i just need time to really think about this and work out the math i don't know what they're going to say but certainly, I know what's going on in my head. What I want to know is what's going on in their head. And body language indicators are a signal to start investigating sometimes. Hope, hope that makes sense to you, Steve. Yeah, well, and, and you just mentioned like the temperature. And so how does the environment impact the way people feel, the way they behave with their gestures? What, what actions should salespeople take in order to control the environment in a way that can put their prospects at ease? Yeah, put a warm cup of coffee in somebody's hand. It's one of the best things you can do. Uh, we know, we know uh, for sure from tests that if you put a warm drink in somebody's hands, they become warmer to the ideas that you're giving them. They, they become warmer to the idea. Put some, put, give them something with sugar in. I mean, unless that you know they're diabetic. But, you know, essentially, if you, if you give them a, a environment full of resource for them, uh, if you lower the risk of the environment for them and you raise the resources that they have, they will be biased towards that environment and you. So that's what you want to be thinking is, how can I make any environment I come into lower risk and fuller of resource? And that way, you're going to see that clients and customers like having you around at a really unconscious level. Interesting. Yeah, the sweetness of the coffee and the warmth of the coffee, that, that's, that is, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, and, and we always, we do a lot of cold water in Western cultures, but in Eastern cultures, like, no, no one gives you cold water in China. It's always, it can be just plain water. It's still going to be like warmed up and heated and like, uh, and that, that's really Western, I think, to give cold water. Yeah, I think, you know, refrigeration is quite a, a Westernized kind of idea. The, the Everything's better if it's, if it's colder. So yeah, sure. If it's a, an overly warm day, then, then yeah, to put something really cold in somebody's hand, and to say, oh, I, th I thought you'd really appreciate a nice cold one. So again, now I'm being really specific around, I have supplied the sensation that they're about to get 
And it's about appreciation of that. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm now layering on the influence and persuasion to say, you know, I'm, I'm a person who can change your environment for the better. Yeah, I, I think this is great. And what, what about in the, in the virtual world that we find ourselves in? And, um, and, and for, for the record, it's uh, the end of January, 2021. What, what do you, what tips do you have for salespeople who may be interacting with people virtually right now? How can, how can they set up a positive environment in virtual meetings yeah so really strong eye contact for a start you know make sure that you uh, one of the techniques that i use is to get a smiley face on a post-it note and stick it behind my camera so that it attracts my attention towards that smiley face and make sure i keep getting consistently strong eye contact down the lens rather than being distracted by everything else going on on the monitor. Make sure your camera is raised to eye level. It's very easy if you're using a laptop, and let me just show you that uh, right now. Very easy if you're using a laptop to be in this kind of situation here where you've got the up the nose shot there. Again, notice the difference. Imagine, well, you know, I am selling you something right now. I'm selling, you know, my expertise. I'm selling an idea of, uh, you know, some, some techniques to help you. There's this expert, and I'm here to help you um, with your communication. Or alternatively, let me just, oh, let me use the same camera. All I'm gonna do is take my waste paper basket, pour out the waste paper, stick my <laughs> waste paper basket underneath my laptop. Yeah, so same lens, same person, same camera, and now the camera's at eye level and I'm looking right down the camera. I'm an expert in my field and I'm here to help you. Yeah, yeah. do you have a bias? <laughs> My guess is, is you have the bias towards the person who is at eye level with you and is getting good, strong eye contact. In fact, we know that eye contact raises your levels of dopamine, which is the, the neurotransmitter that says things are going to get good. Also notice I'm quite well lit up in here. The lighting is good. Your brain prefers the light to the dark. It feels that the dark is more risk and the light is, is less risk. So again, you don't want to create, in fact, let me just, you know, unlight myself here. Let's turn some more lights off. Yeah. Turn that one off. So again, same person. Yeah, just now a darker shot. Same person, same expert. Oh, mm -hmm. let me now move it down here. Yeah, exactly same person. Yeah, same expert. But again, it's just darker around yeah. me now. Mm -hmm. Do you have a bias? My guess is you do. All I did was add light. You can have the best camera in the world. If it's not, if there's no light, that doesn't work. Notice as well, I've got lights in the background here, which don't help light me. They help light the environment uh, around me. Um, lights, lights on in a space has been an indicator for millennia that you are welcome and that there's something intelligent going on as well. So again, I've got lights in the background to give you this sense of you being welcome. I've tried to create a welcoming space here. You get to see my sofa, you get to see pillows, you get to see a blanket, uh, you get to see the lights on. It's hopefully an environment that welcomes you and you feel safe and comfortable in. And that's, you know, going to create an environment that you're more likely to buy in. Right, that makes sense. It's a it's a comforting space, and you can create that feeling even though even though we're remote. Very very cool. Um, it, in one of your videos that I saw, you said that charisma can be taught. Mm -hmm. how, how can salespeople learn to be more charismatic? Yeah, it's really simple. There's lots of models there on charisma with many different factors or a few factors that go into charisma. I'm just going to give you what I think is the most important factor of charisma, which is simply focus. Yeah, somebody charismatic. Yeah, they've got a very uh, strong single point of focus. You know what they're doing. You know where they're going. You know what they're saying. It's very clear and focused. So at the moment, notice how clear and focused I'm being on looking down the camera, pointing towards you, you being the most important thing. You know, I say the word you a lot. Now let me um, be unfocused 
at the moment and uh, have have several things that are going on for me at the same at the same time. Again, how charismatic is is that? And now I'm going to go back to the single point of focus, which is looking down the camera at you. My guess is, is that feels to you more charismatic, more engaging than the person who has many points of focus going on at the yeah. same time. Now, life Absolutely. is full of many points of, of focus, but I'm picking one. <laughs> so the charismatic person picks something and goes for it and makes it clear what's happening so no fiddling with your phones <laughs> no no fiddling with well unless you want to make that the absolute point of focus okay <laughs> because again that could be charismatic you know my guess is now i've made my phone this point of focus my guess is is your brain is going what's going on there what's going on on his screen right now so i can you know it, 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 the focus of charisma can be anything you like. You've got to pick the thing that's going to have the best effect for you, though. And how can salespeople show confidence to their buyers when maybe maybe they're actually super nervous about this meeting or nervous about a sale? How can you project confidence in all situations? Yeah. So, um, so confidence is about other people's trust in us. Again, to, to go back to the etymology of it, confides, from Latin, confides, which fidelity, fides is trust. So when somebody is confident yeah, in you, it means they trust you. That's all. So for you to be confident in me and feel I am a confident person, it's not about me. It's about your trust in me. So what do I do to get you confident about me? What I'm doing is being as predictable as possible. Yeah, so so you can trust that, for example, I'll stay in frame here. You can trust the, the rhythm of the movements that I make. You can trust the eye contact that I give you. You can trust the rhythm of my speech. I'm trying to keep predictable and relatively consistent around what I'm doing so that part of your brain that does this idea of is somebody trust? So trust actually means that you've made a big enough prediction about me already that you trust the future with me. Yeah. So if I were to offer you something that you don't know, okay. Say I say to you, okay. So, um, so I've got a a video product, um, training product. Yeah. And uh, and you've not seen that product. You've not studied that that product. But based on your experience of me so far, zero to 10, zero being least, 10 being most, how good do you think that product is? Zero to 10, zero being least and 10 being most, what's your prediction? I mean, I'd predict it's it's great. I mean, that, that'd be just from what's what I've seen so far, I, I would guess the, that the product is great. And it's, and I, you know, and, Fran, and you're right, you know, you, you make these decisions not knowing anything about the thing, right? Right, so uh, would you be prepared to tell somebody else Okay, and, and I know you have not seen this product, okay? Would you be prepared to tell them that you think it's great? <laughs> That's harder having not seen it, but, yeah, but, but I, mean, I could say, hey. If I, I said, hey, if you see anybody today and they're looking for a video product training on communication, would you, would you tell them about it and, and, and be pretty buoyant about it and optimistic about it? Yeah, if I ran into someone that wanted something like that, I'd probably be like, yeah, well, you know, I actually just came across this thing. You should check it out, I think. It's, it's probably pretty right. good. Right, you've not seen it, have you? You have no <laughs> idea about it. I haven't it. used it myself, but it right. seems great. You haven't used it yourself. <laughs> do, you, do you even know if it exists? May not even exist. No, may not even exist. I haven't seen so, it. <laughs> so ultimately, all you have is trust. And I've built that trust over time. Yes, I've built it verbally as well, but a lot of it is non-verbal as well because I'm saying, oh, tell me this. Um, this video product, the quality of the imagery in it, what's your prediction? Do you think it's high quality or low quality? What do you think? Probably pretty high. Yeah, probably pretty high. Yeah, exactly. You've not seen it. Could be terrible. <laughs> Could have been done, you know, on my phone from the 80s. I don't know, on the 90s or whatever. You know, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But you've what you have is an expectation. You've got a promise 
in your mind. And what's interesting is, is, is you would even be willing to tell somebody else the idea in your mind and having never seen it before. That's what really good trust does. Really good trust means that other people will go to their clients, their colleagues and go, hey, you know, you got to talk to Steve. You got to talk to Mark. You got to talk to this person. Okay. I think they may well have the solution for you. <laughs> it's like, you don't know whether they have, but you're willing, you're willing to give that firm referral, that positive referral, because your expectation is they probably do. And that's what trust is about, essentially. A prediction yeah, you, in the future. That, that That's funny. I've actually had people like refer other people to us, like maybe like a, it, it, there's a, an instance I'm thinking of where like there was a sales thought leader type, you know, a guy that had written a book about sales and, uh, and I'd had him on the podcast and he referred someone to our product, but I knew, I mean, he'd never actually seen our product. I mean, I, he knew it existed because, you know, from talking to us and from just hearing about it around, but like, I, I was pretty sure he'd never actually seen the thing, but he, he still recommended us. <laughs> we, we could have been terrible. <laughs> like... So I've, you know, Steve, I've had exactly the same is that one of my, fir my first big client in, in Canada, when I moved to Canada, so this is about 15 years ago, I had a meeting with this guy and I met him face to face and I, you know, told him what I was doing and demonstrated it and all of that kind of stuff. He then met uh, a, a, a client of his and he said oh you, you gotta you gotta meet this guy okay because he's amazing he does this great stuff this person walked straight into another meeting with somebody he was trying to get as a client and he pitched me he had never met me <laughs> he'd never <laughs> met me and, and this and this uh you know end client called me up and said hey we, you know we're told we've got to meet you we've got to I was like oh yeah okay sure great I didn't know the the guy who'd pitched me at all so I mean that's the level that's the extraordinary thing that can happen when you use this nonverbal piece you know that focused piece what many people call charisma but the message becomes very very clear and the message becomes repeatable and trusted and that's the key. Now you've got a whole bunch of other people doing your sales for you, essentially. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, well, I, I've got another one kind of along these same same lines. You talked about charisma. You talked about confidence. Um, what can salespeople do in order to make their prospects feel that they're making the right choice? Ah, uh, yeah, really good. Really good idea. Uh, I would go back to that piece of... Um, questioning them um questioning them and saying something like what what feels really right about you know making this order or or, or looking down you know researching this more or you know whatever stage you're in and you've taken them to the next stage of the sales process before they continue just go so i'm just curious you know what feels really right about this right now because now they're going to tell you all the things that they're thinking that make this the right idea. And you're going to do really open body language. You're going to tilt your head to one side. You're going to smile gently. You're going to nod. And every now and again, you're going to say, yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So you're going to affirm everything that they're saying in their mind. That may Now, they may say some things that you might think, well, that's not really the really good reason for this. I mean, the really good reason for buying this is X, Y, and Z. I mean, that's what I've been pitching you. No, they're going to buy for whatever good reasons they're going to buy. And they may not be the reasons that you pitched on. They may have some other ideas in their head. But you're going to give them lots of affirmative, lots of accepting body language. Now, accepting doesn't mean you agree. You can accept their reasons and go, so that's really interesting. You've got that reason because most people, they want to buy because of X and they want to buy because of Z. But it's really interesting that it's so important to you that you need to buy because of this reason. So I totally get that and I totally accept that. I think it's a good decision. So again, I, I may give them everybody else's other reasons for buying, but I affirm and and build rank around theirs and again open body language affirmative body language accepting body language very interesting 
Um, very, very interesting. That, that's, that's one I think we can all use. Um, so w- let's uh, move into the next section of the show today called sales in 60 seconds. So this is quick questions, quick answers. Um, okay. First question, what's the one thing salespeople should avoid for a successful first impression? Uh, I would say the first thing to avoid for a successful first impression is kind of just hanging your hands down by your side, you know, and because that will just draw your shoulders forward, hunch you over as you come into a room immediately, hands up, big open body language as you come to meet somebody, whoever they are. Yeah, open them with big open gestures. Like you'd stand in front of a nice warm fire if it were a cold day and let that heat into you. Very different from approaching somebody with your hands down by your side and and that sense of kind of not being elevated or buoyant with your hands. Interesting. Um, what's your top tip for virtual presentations? Yeah, top tip for virtual is is what I've been saying before. Raise that camera to eye level. Get plenty of really good eye contact. You can't do better than that. And what's the most common mistake salespeople make when talking to clients? Uh, I would say getting into arguments. That's that's the main thing. Is is not agreeing or accept not a, not accepting their point of view accepting what they say my guess is is you've got you know as a salesperson you've got a lot of good data about your product or your service you've got a lot of good stuff about that and you know the good reasons why people should buy this or buy more of it or shift products over to you or buy a certain new product from you you've got good reasons around that they've got their good reasons around doing what they're doing you know what's going on in your head. You need to know what's going on in theirs. And therefore, you need a really good interview and interrogation process, which means you ask questions and you shut up and you listen and you accept everything that they're saying. That's the way you get their map of the world out of their head. Once you've got their map of the world, then you can start manipulating that map. Now you can start to really work out what is the journey from where they are right now to where you need them to be. What's the journey from the non-buyer to the buyer? Because if you don't know where they are right now and why they're in that position, you can't help them make that journey. Yeah, that reminds me of like the one of the key principles to starting a a software company or really any kind of company, I guess um, you, you, you want to talk to the, the, er, the, the early people that are trying out and using your product. You have to talk to them all the time and find out how do they describe the value that they're getting from it? Why is it valuable to them? Cause a lot of times you thought it was for this, but that's not how they think of it and what they think is right. <laughs> so right. the reason they think it's valuable for their, for, for their line of work and the reason that why they're buying it, that's the reason that it's really valuable. And, and frankly, you know, like that we kind of went through this to some degree, we thought we were building a mapping solution. Actually, we were building a routing solution in the salesperson's mind. It was less that they wanted to see their territory on a map, but it was more, they wanted to build out their route or their schedule for the day as a result of having the capacity to put their, put their territory on a map. And so we, we shifted a lot of our messaging um, but you'll notice the company is called Badger Mapping, not Badger Routing, you know, because, <laughs> right. but, but actually people don't map with it. They route with it. Right. Which right. is, which is, it uh, would strike me is what they, what they really wanted. I would, I would assume is, is better productivity in mm-hmm. order to have, you know, more chance of more sales. Absolutely. You know, well, certainly an easier life. It's, you yeah. know, well, so you don't time. find you know, saving time. I mean, there's the, the, the value. And that's because uh, I reckon a map you can get just about anywhere, can't you? Sure. I mean, it's the, that's at the gas station. Maybe I should have called right. it Badger Better Life. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like, who wouldn't buy that? Who would yeah. buy a better life? <laughs> 
had to make had to make it specifically for salespeople. But I mean, I guess right. I could make anyone's life better, really. <laughs> well, right. Why makes the addressable market way better, way bigger if I just make everyone's but life I think, better? I think you hit a really <laughs> a good point there, which is you know one of the best questions you can ever ask somebody and kind of look at what happens to their face and look at how they light up and look at how animated they get is is you know what for you is most valuable about this product this service you know and 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 put you know i'm just curious i'm just interested at the moment you know what is really most valuable for you and it's that question most valuable for you because it means that you don't go oh i'm really hoping they're giving going to give the answer that that last person gave or that's in our marketing material or that's you know in our in our unique you know selling proposition it's just you're interested what is valuable for them today may change tomorrow it could be different but today because if they verbalize that and you accept and agree they love it yeah well i mean it, when as you described that it kind of uh, felt like a setup for a close to me it's like okay what's what tell me about what's so valuable about this for you and then it's then it's like uh, agreeing and okaying because whatever whatever their reason is is the right reason and yeah. it's almost like great so are we doing this now <laughs> right, right, right. exactly yeah yeah i mean that's what the, you know if i'm doing if i'm selling some coaching for example some one-to-one -one coaching with me or any kind of training product or you know i'll have an initial conversation at the end of that i'll go so i'm just curious you know what was most valuable for you about having this quick conversation yeah and then they tell me they go well it was this 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 and that you know they'll give me some things sometimes i'm i'm like wow i didn't expect to hear that I didn't think that's what I was actually really selling. But then I go, okay, so if, if I could give you more of that, would that be helpful to you? That's really <laughs> impossible for them to resist. They can't go, these were the best things and I don't want more of them. Like I've got my fill of that now. <laughs> you know, they always go, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you might you want to say, so, so how do you want to do this? So it's like, I'm not going to solve your buying problem. You're going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> how are you going to solve this buying problem? Because then they'll go, well, I, I guess I guess you should send us a proposal or I guess you should send us the invoice or I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you can either go, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'll do. Or you can go, well, actually, that's not quite how we do it. We do it this way. But first of all, first off, I get them to solve their problem. Very cool. That's I mean, this is just invaluable stuff, I think. Um, so. Tell me what happens if you don't do what you're teaching us to do. What happens when your audience doesn't get enough nonverbal information? Yeah, just life becomes harder for you. That's all. It's not that you listen. It's not that you, you, you could, you, we all know you can sell over the phone <laughs> with, a, with no, you know, visual body language at all. It's just, if you get into competition with somebody who's showing up live in front of people, now you've got, now life has become harder for you. So I'm not saying that you need great nonverbal communication. You don't if you don't have any competition. If you have a monopoly, if you're a government organization that you have to buy from the government or you have to, you know, if you, if you have a product that there's only you delivering it and you are the best, you probably don't even need salespeople. Mm -hmm. you probably, probably just people will come asking for it. You set the price, you're done. But if you're in competition, then you need to make that route to people buying have less friction. And really good nonverbal communication reduces the friction because people get more comfortable. They understand you better. They like being with you more. That's all less friction. And, and it means you can beat your competition. Because if they're not doing it, they've got friction that you don't have. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a reason we don't just have a, a website for every product and just buy everything on Amazon or something. There's a reason there's, you know, salespeople and, and more, more importantly for most of the people listening to this is there's, there's a reason there's field salespeople. And that is that this, the, you know, the in-person interaction just works a lot better for most customers. It builds trust better. It builds connection better. You can communicate things better. Um, if, if it was, if you could just, you know, put your medical device on a website and, you know, sell, sell just as much of it, then, uh, you would. And, and to your point with monopolies uh, or, uh, 
you know, if you don't have any competitors, like when I, you know, when I was at Google, so I was selling the software and, and on that side of the business, you know, the, all their enterprise software products, but the 98% of the, their revenue at the time was coming from, coming from Google ads, right? Right. They didn't really have a sales team for Google ads. They had a, I guess I would call it a customer success team. It was like, you know, they, it was called sales, but really they were in the business of just helping the important customers get more out of the products because they they sold themselves to a large degree. The price was set by auctions that didn't have to get worked out. That that was a key role a salesperson would have done, but also like everyone just kind of needed the Google and what are you going to do? Go buy Google from the other Google. There is no other sure. Google. So you're going to buy, you're going to buy the Google from our Google. <laughs> right. So, right. so, uh, so yeah, I, I think what you're saying really certainly ring, ring rings. But you know, me. you know, if I was starting up a competitor to that, to that product and, and I could get everything else the same or even not the same, the first thing I would do is hire a really good salesperson to go to Google's biggest customers and go live and walk in that building and build trust, get yeah. to know people, do the, the really great work that salespeople do, which is change behaviors. That's what, that's what salespeople do. They change behaviors. And, and that is the most difficult work on the planet. You go to any psychiatrist, you go to any therapist and go like, what are you trying to do? They'll go, I'm trying to change the mindset of these people. I'm trying to change their behaviors. Well, what are your chances? Well, you know, we have to work really, really hard. You have to see the person once a week, you know, find out why are they doing what they're doing? You know, what's going on for them? Show them better options, help them talk through it, help them think about their life. You know, sales is doing the same, helping people think about their business, think about their life, look at different options, test those new behaviors and change those. Hard, hard job to do. Uh, you need as least friction as possible. So think about the nonverbal communication part of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, and, and you, you, keep, you keep bringing up truth and, and uh, trust I know that you talk a lot about the truth plane. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really know what that is, but I know it's a, a thing you talk about a lot. What, what is it? What is, what's the truth plane? Yeah. So the truth plane is the uh, horizontal vertical plane that is at exactly navel level. So imagine if I had a table which kind of cuts through my navel area, that would be the truth plane. And when you gesture at the truth plane and the whole and more of the body can be seen, that is a big indicator for other human beings to trust you. So at the moment, you know, if you're watching on video, you'll see me sitting and gesturing at the truth plane for you right now. Notice the difference between if I don't gesture at all at that plane. Again, you know, I'm here to help you. You can trust me. Or alternatively, gesturing at the truth plane, I'm here to help you. You can trust me. Notice the difference. For sure. Had universal signal across the planet so yeah. it's one of the biggest indicators we can play with people in terms of them uh being triggered to trust us immediately that's why i named my company after it truth plane gotcha okay um and as an actionable takeaway what do the field salespeople listening today do as a first step towards improving their verbal communication or their non-verbal communication yeah, so I would start to think about the behaviors that you can do on purpose. Think about behaviors, for example, that you do, which you would call accepting behaviors, accepting body language. How can you increase that? How can you especially increase it when you're feeling pushback from that person you're trying to sell to? When they've got uh, an argument for you, uh, how can you, instead of pushing back at them, be more accepting of them? The more you can perform these accepting behaviors, the more you'll influence and persuade others. Okay, I'm going to try to summarize what Marx told us today. First of all, we judge people instantly based on their nonverbal communication. And once a judgment is made, it tends to stick. So it's best to make a great first impression. Mark, Mark has recommended a few gestures to get started. First of all, the open palm gestures to be very open, show that you're low risk, 
you know, I think this, this hits the lizard brain by showing that we're not carrying a weapon he mentioned. You want to use baton gestures, you know, like a conductor carries a baton, gestures that follow the rhythm of your speech. Follow the rhythm of your speech. <laughs> and apparently that, that, uh, that helps people connect with you. You also want to use illustrator gestures, right? So you want to use gestures that illustrate the word that you're saying. And you can see Mark doing this the whole time. He's got a whole bunch of little gestures that he uses with different words. Animate yourself with facial expressions and tone of voice to help keep your customers engaged. Accepting body language helps salespeople avoid coming off as pushy. Use open palms, tilt your head to the side and nod. Read your prospect's body language by paying attention to big changes in their body language. So like leaning back in their chair after they've been leaning forward, scooting back, scooting up. When a big change occurs, ask, ask a question. Use it as an, use it as an opportunity. because It's almost like their brain is signaling that they are undergoing some kind of change or have something to say. So ask, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think or what do you feel or what do you think and or feel about what I just said? Um, it's a really good way to just stop for a second and, and kind of uh, get them to communicate because they it's almost like they want to communicate and they're showing that by making changes to their body language. You can lower the risk of an environment during a meeting, the risk, I mean, it's not really a risky, it's a business meeting, but you can make them, you, it, affect their lizard brain, let them feel comfortable during a meeting and, and therefore more open to your ideas by giving them something warm, like a warm cup of coffee. During a virtual meeting, you want to make sure that the camera is at eye level and not below you and looking up your nose. And you want to make, you want to make eye contact. Um, you want to have a welcoming setup behind you uh, Mark recommended great lighting, having a, a lamp on in the back, having light coming in from the side. You actually noticed that he, he had a, one of those big, powerful lights that you would normally not use to light up a room, but because he's doing you know, a, a meeting of this nature, he's got a big, powerful light, um, not shining at him, but shining at the room around him. Uh, I'm not doing that. I just have a window myself. But um, So... To be charismatic, you want to choose a certain point of focus. Your customer should be your focus. And, and uh, you know, if you're fidgeting and moving around and looking at your phone, it, 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 uh, it, it makes you seem less charismatic. Confidence is all about building other people's trust in us. So you build trust by being predictable, by setting good expectations and meeting those expectations. Finally, make prospects feel that they're making the right choice by asking, why do you think this is the right choice? Or why do you, why do you think this is the right decision? Or what have you liked about what I've said today? Then, then you listen to them and you affirm their answers by nodding and saying things like, exactly, right, right. Well, um, you know, tell me, uh, Mark, where can our listeners read more about your work and where can they reach out to you? Yeah, so just find me at truthplane.com, T-R-U-T-H-P-L-A-N-E, truthplane.com. Find me there. You'll find my website. Lots of videos on there for you to watch. Uh, you can go to my YouTube channel. You'll find me at Mark Bowden. Uh, or just Google Mark Bowden, and up I'll come. You'll find my books, videos, Truthplane. Google me. I'm the first Mark Bowden you'll see. <laughs> well, um, well, this has been a, an absolutely fantastic episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you're in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps, the number one route planner that helps you sell 20% more and drive 20% less. Get a free trial at Badger Mapping today. If you can think of any other sales reps who would benefit from learning the skills that Mark's told us about today, um, please forward this episode on to them. It's, uh, I think it kind of stands alone in terms of being an educational tool. So. Uh, take care. Until next time, everybody.